So what is it about Caitlin Clark that's important? I mean, she's really important right now. She's white. She's straight. In the summer of 2023, Caitlin Clark's likeness was carved out of butter for the Iowa State Fair. In April 2024, she was the number one pick for the WNBA Indiana Fever. Clark received endorsement deals from Gatorade, State Farm Insurance, and Nike, earning her tens of millions of dollars. She has a very old school basketball ability, which is she can shoot the ball from a very long way away. You know, these sort of three point shots, almost like she's Jimmy Chitwood from the movie Hoosiers. In college, she had a bit of a rivalry with this player, Angel Reese from Louisiana State University, who's her sort of polar opposite. You know, she's tall, she's black. I don't know about her sexual orientation, but and she's like sort of proud of her street cred and that she's, you know, she always says that she's straight and she's unapologetic about it. I think she's from Baltimore. Anyway, Angel Reese plays on the Chicago Sky and her, her, her teammate on the Chicago Sky, a Angel Reese's teammate, whose name is, I think, Kennedy Carter, just out of nowhere shoved Caitlin Clark t to the ground and was assessed a foul. And Hitting a shot, then heading over to Clark and shoulder checking her. The refs called it a common foul, but the league yesterday upgraded the call to a flagrant foul. As David Shields, author of How We Got Here, pointed out, Clark represents the values of the American Midwest. She is a farm girl made good. Not glamorous, not sophisticated, but traditional, wholesome, and, well, white. Urban blackness, or blue state degeneracy, is now juxtaposed against, or maybe even opposed by, Caitlin Clark. Christian civilization has come to the WNBA. Or that's what both sides of America's political culture are selling us. The truth is that Caitlin Clark is from Des Moines. To say Caitlin Clark is a farm girl is a bit misleading. Yes, her parents work in the agricultural industry, or her father does, but her father works for Concentric International. The company's website claims that Concentric thinks globally. They connect retail, wholesale, and original equipment manufacturers with the value of global sourcing for products in agricultural, construction, industrial, lawn and garden, professional turf, and utility equipment. The company's mainstay factories are located in China. Brent Clark is the vice president of operations and has a degree in business sales and marketing from Simpson College. The agricultural industry in America is highly centralized and concentrated. It is big business, and while there are still many small family farms, they only generated about 18% of the total product in 2023. The idyllic image of rural America, the notion that flyover country is one big Mayberry, is simply untrue. The falseness of the prevailing narrative is made even clearer when we compare the upbringing of Kennedy Carter, the WNBA player who gave Caitlin a hard foul, to Caitlin's upbringing. Kennedy is from Mansfield, a suburb of Texas with a population that is less than half the size of Des Moines. The average household income in Mansfield is $135,000. It is nearly as white as Des Moines demographically. Kennedy Carter's mother is an elementary school teacher Mansfield has a low rate of crime. There are class differences and racial differences that certainly put Caitlin at an advantage. But do these two women really represent different cultures or different sets of values? According to the media spectacle, yes. But in order to believe this, we have to ignore the obvious, namely that everything operates at the level of PR, spectacle, and perception management. Consider this, when I did some quick research on Caitlin Clark's parents, the Brent Clark I initially found when I searched for the name, along with the phrase agricultural industry on Google, was the wrong Brent Clark. This Brent Clark, like Caitlin's dad, 
works in the agricultural industry, but he sells crop insurance for the Silvius Insurance Group. His profile on the company website indicates that before he was an insurance agent, he was a marketing director for a grain elevator. This is the world we live in. Capital has concentrated to such a degree that the silos that store grain require a marketing department. And in a world where even grain elevators need marketing, women's basketball most certainly does. Since Caitlin Clark was signed for the Indiana Fever, ticket sales and television ratings have soared for the WNBA. For the first time, the league is actually making money. And while Clark is a good player and is even breaking records as a rookie, the narrative around her is certainly a large part of the reason she's driving so much attention in this attention economy. The one I'm trying to say about the Caitlin Clark, Angel Reese stuff is that that she's a very good player, you know, kind of like Trump has certain abilities or did where, you know, for a while he's a very good insult comedian. Like he he definitely had or has performance chops that he was he was very skillful on the campaign trail. I think those skills have ba have badly atrophied. But anyway, the degree of re of resentment people feel toward Caitlin Clark being push and the also the huge glamorization of her as this sort of you know great white hope almost literally and that and then on the other hand the the, the black players and the lesbian players resentment of her like why is she getting all of the money because you know it's like they're these other players who are probably better than her stronger than her faster than her they're more experienced than her, but no one's giving them the money because they're not <clears throat> straight, white, handsome young women. They're, you know, they're lesbian or they're black. And I feel like in this, and then it, it reached the its apotheosis when I think guess her name is Chennedy Carter pushed her. And that that you either had to sort of double down on sort of black anger and you sort of go the Chennedy Carter route or you had to kind of create the space for Caitlin Clark and say we're with you Caitlin Clark all these black people these trans people these lesbian people they're taking away what once used to be good in the good American soul and I do think that is Trump's you know, it's almost literally, there it is, make America great again. Caitlin Clark is the embodiment of that. She has old school values. Her father was her coach. She played in, you know, the driveway with her two basketball playing brothers. Through her, I really understand the Trumpian cadre, which is you've taken everything away from, from us, whether jobs to China, black people, affirmative action, transgender bathrooms, and now look at what you're doing. You're pushing her over that you you pushed her and c committed a flagrant foul against you, and we are so angry that we have been displaced from our central role in the culture. <laughs> If we bracket out her actual talent when looking for an explanation for Caitlyn's popularity and only consider the marketing of her persona, one easy explanation for her success is that she appeals to sports fans on the basis of white racial resentment. However, what we should realize is that this approach to marketing is not necessarily a reflection of any spontaneous attitude in the ticket buying public. In 1941, Adorno published an essay entitled On Popular Music in the journal Studies in Philosophy and Social Science, a publication from the Institute of Social Research. In this essay, he argued, quote, the promoters of commercialized entertainment exonerate themselves by referring to the fact that they are giving the masses what they want. But even if they do want it, we are still left with the question of why. What Adorno points out is that the masses are themselves produced 
just as much as the Basketball League or Caitlin Clark is produced. They are produced in a number of different ways. How is this done? Adorno points out that the realm of entertainment feeds on and reinforces distraction and inattention. He explains that this inattention and distraction is a product of the capitalist mode of production as it engenders fears and anxiety about unemployment, loss of income, war, and so on. The non-productive realm within capitalism is entertainment, that is, relaxation, which does not involve the effort of concentration at all. People want to have fun. A fully concentrated and conscious experience of art is possible only to those whose lives do not put such a strain on them that in their spare time they want relief from both boredom and effort simultaneously. The form this relief takes is different based on the type of personality the entertainment industry produces. And this includes what raw material the industry is molding into shape for the market. Adorno claims that there are two types of listeners to popular music, the rhythmical type and the emotional type. According to Adorno, the first sort of listener to popular music is the rhythmical type. He follows the beat of the music and ignores the individualizing aberrations that may obtain in a given work. He responds to the music with a desire to obey, to be led. I don't want to hear it. Dad, let me explain. I've heard it all a million times. But Dad, I didn't... That's it. Just get it done. The emotional listener is similar to the moviegoer and is driven by the guiding principle of wish fulfillment. Adorno wrote, What occurs is this. When the audience at a sentimental film or sentimental music festival becomes aware of the overwhelming possibility of happiness, they dare to confess to themselves what the whole order of contemporary life ordinarily forbids them to admit, namely, that they actually have no part in happiness. It seems to me that this is the level at which contemporary American politics primarily plays out. And given that our politics are divided in half, there are two different sentiments that operate, and both are nostalgic. The first, dominant sentiment, operates on the level of resentment over a world lost. This world is the world before or after modern capitalism. The world is given symbolic expression in the figure of the other. The black lesbian player from the streets represents the lost promise of an organically whole and harmonious past or utopian communist post-heteronormative, no longer cisgendered, non-white female future. Whereas the Iowa farm girl with her college education and commitment to family values represents the lost past of white civilization, a past that has destroyed or is in the process of being destroyed by this lesbian black other. This lost past is associated with what could be obtained in the present if capitalism was allowed to function properly. Both visions, both sentiments, are founded on a romantic illusion. And Adorno says that the emotional type with its wish fulfillment approach to, to music consumes music so that it, he or she can find an excuse to weep. Perhaps today we consume basketball in order to find an excuse to scream. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>